As we get ready to walk our way towards next Sunday, the most glorious day in, in our worship year as we celebrate Easter and the resurrection, uh, we're walking along through a lot before we get there. But this morning as we begin our worship and our time of, uh, for a sermon, I want to take a second just to say a few things. One, wasn't it amazing and beautiful to watch all of those children working their way in and out of here this morning? I think one of the things that uh, happens quite often is sometimes because our children are out of sight, they're out of mind. And we don't realize what a marvelous job that Amy is doing and the amazing uh, work of the folks who work in that area. Then on a given Sunday, uh, the numbers of children and families that are back there are absolutely mind-boggling. And we don't always see that. But we are so proud of them and the families that count themselves as part of this family. I looked on the back row over here this morning to see three little newborns, uh, nearly newborns, being held by their moms on the back row. And then to take note over here this morning of the, uh, the flower, when we put that there, it's always a reminder to us of the birth of a new member of the church family. And Colin Thomas has come to be with us, Michael and Wynn's son. I think we may even have a picture there somewhere. And uh, uh, technology, don't you love it? Look at the e-letter this week. It will be there. And uh, we're excited to welcome the newest member of our church family just this week. Precious, precious folks. But just as there are comings, there are also goings. And this week we, we don't celebrate. We mark and we recognize the significance of uh, 12 years in this place for uh, the, the Lilies and for Phil and Carol and the marvelous job that you've done, but more importantly, the place you have within our heart. And we cannot thank you enough for who you've been and who you are in this place. And yes. <clears throat> yeah. Thank you. After our service this morning, uh, and it's only fitting that Phil should deliver the benediction, don't you think? Yes, yes. and so as he does that, and then we will meet out in the narthex and to uh, take a time just to greet and recognize their time among us. Uh, not just the job that they have done through all these years, but more importantly, just the heart that they love this church and these people with and allow us to love them back. And we, uh, we celebrate that. It's Chattanooga's gain. Uh, I'm already covetous of uh, First Baptist of Chattanooga because I have a hunch they may become your family up there and uh, we wish you all the best. We truly do. One last word on Thursday of this week. We'll also gather in the narthex for one of the most unusual and to me one of the most meaningful services of the year and that is Monday Thursday. We'll come together celebrating the night that Jesus gathered with his disciples to share with them the, the cup the bread, and the recognition of about what was about to unfold. As we do, we'll share communion. In tradition of the foot washing, we'll also have a traditional hand washing time together. We celebrate that. That has proven uh, among us to be one of the most meaningful things that we do together throughout the year. And I'll know you'll want to be a part of that. Let's take just a moment, if you would, and go to our Lord in prayer. Father, as we prepare to look into your word and to contemplate on the events of the last week, of this week that we call holy, we stop to thank you for your love for us. We stop to recognize the sacrifice that Jesus was about to make. And we stop, Lord, to remember that that was always his nature as it was always yours. I pray, Father, in this time that we spend together, we can look more clearly into the eyes of our Savior and see who He is, who He was in those days and who He continues to desire to be, not just in our life, but in this world that you and He created and that He came to redeem. That is my hope, my prayer, and my expectation, and I make it in the strong, strong name of Jesus. 
Amen. Have you ever had a season in your life for a week or two where things just got weird? Do you know what I'm talking about? It's kind of like something happens, you go, I didn't see that coming, and about the time you figure that out, something else comes along and along, and two weeks in, you kind of look back and say, Lord, what is going on here? Well, that's kind of been my story for the last little bit. We got off our vacation on Sunday morning two weeks ago. I uh, went to the house, put things away, going out to get an early lunch and sitting at a crosswalk, dead still, I looked around and the car slammed into our side and all of a sudden I had a Tahoe in my lap. Uh, you don't want a Tahoe in your lap. Uh, just, I was kind of like, just, what is this? Well, it, it's all right, the, the, I, we survived, the car really didn't, but it's back together now. And so you kind of wonder if they're saying, Lord, what else is going to go on here? Well, we found out that my mom had been in a car wreck. And so we're trying to put things back together with that. And I'm still kind of at that point trying to get over the, uh, the flu that I had had. And two weeks into it now, I've traded in flu on pink eye. Uh, yeah, that's, you see what happened is Lisa went to visit our children and our granddaughter, Abby. And Abby, somebody at preschool gave it to Abby. Abby gave it to Lisa. Lisa came home, and if she had not insisted on kissing me at the door when she came in, <clears throat> I would not have this pink eye. But, uh, but I do. So you got all that wish. But you know what? All of those things going on, two trips back and forth to Moultrie, keep my mom in your prayers. This is kind of a, a tenuous time for us and our family. In between it was probably the weirdest thing of all. It was Wednesday, week before last, I woke up, and I had an allergic reaction to something. Uh, and my lips swole up, and my tongue swole up, and I had a hard time talking there. And so I knew it wasn't awful, it wasn't bad, but Lisa said, well, make sure you call your doctor as she was getting ready to leave town to go on her trip. And my doctor uh, heard me stumbling over my words, and, I, and she said, go to the ER immediately. Immediately, go to the ER. I'm like, I don't want to go to the ER, but then I don't want to be that jerk whose doctor tells him something to do and said, I don't think I want to do that. So I relented, and Lisa took me over to the ER, and we, I got checked in there. And, and as we suspected, it was, it was just the reaction. In fact, by the time they got through with me, it had all subsided. Everything was good, and they ran tests, determined I didn't have a stroke, and I didn't have a heart attack, and all was good with the world. And so I finally persuaded Lisa, look, you got to get on your trip. You got to get going. Uh, traffic's coming. Take off. Go check on mama. Go on up the next day to, to Huntsville. And so she did. Well, a couple hours later, they, they cut me loose. And so I walked out and, and I had uh, walked out the door. And if you could remember a week ago last Wednesday, it was the most beautiful day that I've seen in forever in St. Petersburg. It was Chamber of Commerce. And after sitting in that ER for hours and hours and hours, I, I walked out and I told Lisa I was just going to call a friend and get a ride or grab an Uber. But I said to myself, self, this is a gorgeous day. I ran nine miles three weeks ago. I can walk three miles home and enjoy this. So I did. And I started strolling down the road and I was enjoying it. As we get in. About two miles into that, I heard a voice go, Glenn. Glenn, kind of confused. I turned around and it was a friend. It was a no doubt well-meaning friend. And as he called me over to the car, he looked at me. And here I was walking home on a weekday afternoon with a bottle of, with a package of medicines in my hand, several bottles there with everything I'd had. And he notices that there is a hospital band on my wrist. And I am sure that his mind went to one flew over the cuckoo's nest to Jack Nicholson in that very moment. And then he asked me, where have you been? And I said, I was at the ER. He said, which one? I said, St. A's. And he said, well, where's Lisa? I said, she's not here. I sent her away. <laughs> and then he said, well, who took you there? I said, it was Lisa before I sent her away. He said, get in the car, man. I'm taking you home. And we got home and he finally let me in. I was trying to explain all of these things and, you know, what he's seeing in those moments. And he texts me later, says, Glenn, are you okay? Do I need to take you somewhere? 
And I showed him, man, all was good, all was right. What you thought you saw, you did not see. You know, there was more going on there. It was all good. And it, all these days later, you got to laugh. You just have to laugh. Well, you know, Jesus was getting ready to begin that last week. And I guess what I went through that day I was walking was another example of how somebody could be coming down the road Somebody sees what's going on and thinks they know what's going on or has a suspicion, and that's not what's going on. Well, that's kind of the story of the triumphal entry as well. The thing that we celebrate on what we call Palm Sunday, and some traditions Passion Sunday, was to know that Jesus was getting ready to begin the week that we call holy, putting into motion that which he came from heaven to earth for. Putting into play the very events that would lead to his death, that would lead to his resurrection. Trying as he might to prepare his followers for what he was about to happen, knowing that they were going to be confused and they were going to miss it, and hoping that somewhere down the road it would make more sense to them and they could then see more clearly. You see, that's the text that we have in Mark's Gospel, chapter 11. I'll ask you to look there. Knowing that this telling of the story of the triumphal entry is one of the very few events in Jesus' life that makes it into all four Gospels. Uh, Matthew tells us about how it relates to the Old Testament prophecies. Luke, not surprisingly, the doctor in touch with people's feelings and emotions, he goes out of his way to tell us what Jesus felt in those very moments. John told us how it connected to the religious establishment of the day, and in typical fashion, Mark just gives us the facts. He's the Joe Friday of the New Testament, just the facts, ma'am. So here are the facts. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethpage and Bethany on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples, hold that thought, two of his disciples saying to them, go to the village ahead of you. And just as you enter it, you'll find a colt, a donkey tied there, which no one's ever ridden. Uh, Untie it and bring it here. And if someone asks you, uh, why are you doing this? Tell him the Lord needs it and and we'll send it back here shortly. And they went and they found a colt inside in the street tied to a, a doorway and they untied it. And some people standing there ask, what are you doing uh, untying that colt? And they answered just as Jesus had told them to, and and the people let them go. And when they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks over it, he sat on it. And many people spread their cloaks on the road, and while others spread branches that they had cut in the fields. And those who went ahead and those who followed shouted, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David, Hosanna, in the highest. Jesus entered Jerusalem and he went to the temple. He looked around at everything, but since it was already late, he he left. And he went out to Bethany with the twelve. An initial reading, it is an unusual story in the gospel. You do get to the point where Jesus is beginning to Uh, put to play into that what's going to happen that week. And those around him that had followed him, that had marveled at his miracles, that had listened to his teaching, and did all of that against the backdrop of how they understood the world at that time, began to come and say, this is it. The king is coming. The king is here. Uh, He's going to come and he's going to make things all right. Uh, He's going to do all the things that we want him to, but they missed some things along the way. You see, they were looking at Jesus through their eyes and not through the eyes of the Lord who had come that they might see more clearly. You see, they were right, the people were, to give honor. They were right to worship Jesus. They were right to proclaim uh, his greatness and to tell it to all the world. But there still were some things that they got wrong. Has that ever happened to you? Have you ever thought you understood what was going on and then realized, no, that that wasn't it? 
Have you ever had an opinion on something and that opinion somewhere along the way gets changed? In fact, I would suggest to you, if you've not changed your opinion on something fairly significant in the last year, you're not thinking enough. And the truth is, most of us resist changing our opinion on most of anything. You see, Jesus is coming against that backdrop and he's saying, guys, you still don't get it. I'm glad that you're celebrating me. I'm glad that you're recognizing me as king. But five days from now, they're going to take me and put me on trial and they're going to carry me up on a hill and crucify me. And it's going to look like it's all over. And we lost. You're going to think that what you're doing today is absolute foolishness. But hang around for a few more days and I'm going to come back. I'm going to fulfill the truth that not even the grave can hold me. He's going to fulfill the truth that he has come to this world not just to overcome death, but to overcome sin. He's going to demonstrate it to us that even when we reject him at our fullest, he loves us so much that even that won't keep him away and won't keep him down. But in those moments, he's still wondering, are they going to figure this thing out? Because there's still a lot they've got wrong. Well, to get a picture of this, you only have to back up into the preceding chapter and to take a look at the stories of what happens immediately before. In chapter 10 and in verse 15, you, you get this little encounter with James and John, who were the sons of Zebedee. You remember, them, you remember them. And they came to Jesus and they said this. They said, teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. Okay. Don't you love it when, folks, I'm going to ask you to do something. I want you to do whatever it is. Now, this precious little girl that my wife is holding right over here in the, about three rows back is our, our granddaughter, Maddie. And uh, Maddie is a sweetheart, and she's, she's looking at me like, now, you're talking about me, aren't you, Pop? Let me tell you a little something about Maddie. She's got this really neat little trick that she will come up to you and shine those amazing blue eyes up at you and go, Pop, I have an idea. And the idea is whatever she wants you to do. That's her preference. That's, that's her thing. I have an idea. Well, James and John came up to Jesus, and they looked at him and said, Jesus, we've got an idea. You're about to come into power, and we want you to do whatever we ask you to do. Now, here it is. When you come into the kingdom, when you come in to be the, be the sure enough king, we want to be at your right hand, and we want to be at your left hand, we want to be... You're, you're, we want to be right there. We want to be the hand that is right there with you. And elevate us. To which Jesus says, you really don't know what you're asking for. Because if you hadn't figured it by now, the gospel is not about self-elevation. The gospel is not about me. The gospel is about emptying yourself. The gospel is about sacrificing. The gospel is about hearing our Jesus when he says, if you want to be great in God's kingdom, learn to be the servant of all. How many times has Jesus taught that, yet still two of his most trusted disciples come to him and ask such a ridiculous thing of him? Do whatever it is that we want you to do for us. Now, the next telling of the story behind that is the story of blind Bartimaeus. We won't go into great detail with that, although it's, I, I do remember every time I read that text, a friend of mine, uh, Dave Newman, who uh, owned a company called Bar Bartimaeus Inc., uh, and the company, they sold blinds. And so that anybody could ask him, what's the name of, your, uh, of your, your business? He'd say, well, that's the blind man in the Bible. I am the blind man. So, um, when Bartimaeus comes up and... Jesus asked him, what do you want me to do for you? Bartimaeus has a real simple request. I just want to see. I just want to be able to look and to see anything. To let light come into my eyes and, and let, me, let me experience that. Jesus said, your faith has made you well and he was healed. You see, he once was blind, but now he sees. But James and John, who one day will see, are still 
blind. I don't think it's an accident that Mark puts those stories in that place in that order. And then we carries us from there into the events of the triumphal entry. You see, when we think about James and John, we have to acknowledge something as people of faith. It is easy for us, as hard as we want to be on them at that moment, it is easy for us to co-op Jesus and make him as we want him to be for us, to justify our preferences, to serve us, to give us a gospel of prosperity or to a gospel of exclusiveness, or somehow to even look to Jesus to justify our behaviors that are not of him. It's easy for us to do that, just as it was for James and John. See, James and John didn't get around to asking the question in that moment, what would Jesus do? Remember the WWJD? Or the question, what would Jesus not do? There's some things I just can't picture Jesus doing. Or what would Jesus undo, as my friend Michael Bodge wrote in his book and in a wonderful song. You see, if we could see things as Jesus sees them, and not be blind ourselves, we might have a different view of those things. We might decide that the God of the universe really is the God of the universe, not just the God of me. We might just decide that the Jesus who came to give his life for sinners includes us and others around us, and the grace that is given to us, we should freely give to others. That's what Jesus did. To understand that we follow a Jesus that is never hateful, Never once. Couldn't be. It's not his nature. He was never dismissive. He was never selfish. He was never uncaring. He was never exploited. Uh, he was never arbitrary. And he was never taken away with his own sense of importance. You know, I've got to tell you, thank God it's a minority, I hope, but a whole lot of Christians I encounter don't pass that test. Sometimes I don't either. Sometimes you don't. You see, it's easy to miss seeing Jesus for who he is, to care about the things that he cares about, see the things that others, that, that he cares about, and see the things that he wants to do something about. See, the problem is it is easy for us to make God in our own image and want Jesus to be just like we want him to be for us. Uh, Tony Campolo tells a great story. That he was asked to speak uh, in a Chinese Baptist church. Uh, and outside of Philadelphia where he, he still lives. He said this many years ago he went there to, that, uh, to the church to teach. And he saw a picture of Jesus back behind the pulpit. It was a picture, of, you know, it's definitely it was Christ. But it was Christ with very distinct oriental features. And his first thought was, Jesus wasn't Asian. Jesus didn't look like that. Uh, it, it wasn't hard on the people, but he made that note that, you know, that's just, it seems a little weird that in a Chinese church that they would have a picture of Jesus that looked very, very much like, not Jesus of Nazareth, but maybe Jesus of Beijing, until he went back to his home church and he saw the same picture of Jesus that probably hung in your Sunday school class and above your grandmother's mantle. You know that Aryan, blonde-haired, blue-eyed Jesus? You know the picture? Folks, I've been to Israel. They don't look like that. We all can create Jesus in our own image. We can co-op him to being what we want him to be, to justify the things that we want, the things that we care about, to elevate ourselves. It's easy to do that. And sometimes even to justify how we see the world and how we treat other people. Anne Lamott, great writer, 
says these words that you can be, you can safely assume that you have created God in your own image when it turns out that God hates the same people that you do. You see, that phrase elicits a giggle, maybe a sigh, and then maybe a ugh, because it's true. We create God in our own image because we want him to love the things we love and hate the things we hate. We want him to embrace the things that we endorse and and push the things away that we don't. To bless the people who are like us and that we approve of and to take the others and go, ah, push those away. That's not God's nature. That's not what he does. You see, when he was standing there, Jesus was coming into the city Here sat these people, acting out of good mind and good heart and good conscience. But deep down within that, they were hoping that this was a ruler that was going to overthrow the powers that be that were oppressing them. Somebody's going to get it, and this Jesus is going to do it, and we're going to be better off because of it. Jesus says, no, that's not how it is. When they saw Jesus come in, they said, this is the Jesus that is so powerful. He's going to be victorious over everything in this world that we want destroyed. And he's going to be so popular among those who follow him. And we're just going to love him and he's going to love us. And we're just going to have a love fest. It's all going to be so, so great. He's so wonderful. We can look up to him. He just has a parade that exerts his authority, his greatness and Somehow they missed the fact that the sign of a conquering emperor was to ride on a big white horse. Yet this Savior chose to sit on a donkey and come in as unpretentious as he could. Do you catch it that the same animal that ushered him to the place where he came into this world would be the same lowly, nondiscreet animal that would carry him into the city that would take him out? Think about that. So that changes our picture and our understanding a little bit. You see, they wanted a king that they could look up to and, 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 and admire for all the wrong reasons but not a king who would know them intimately. Not a king that would dare them to change themselves. Not a king who was only king of their people, but king of all the people. That's not what they were looking for. And Jesus was probably not surprised when they didn't see it either. This morning... Find yourself in that story. We, we look at that story and perhaps it helps us to understand more clearly who Jesus really is and in that moment was and what that means for us. You see, it's easy once we get to next Sunday to kind of lose sight of all that happened behind it. Jesus said, make sure you understand what I'm saying here. I came to give my life. I, I didn't come to to absolutely push down everybody and everything. I I came to empty myself and to teach you to do the same. I came to understand that the, the whole of history is about people who look at God and look at Jesus from the wrong set of eyes, see what they want to see, and they miss it. Hear what they want to hear and go, hear God saying, no, that's that's not what I meant. That's not what I said. And it challenges us, one, to see Jesus more clearly, but also to take into account that sometimes the best thing we can ever say is, you know, I think I look at that differently now than I used to. I, I can see clearly, now the rain is gone, as Johnny Nash would sing. I have a different perspective than I used to. Life has taught me to see things differently. And I'm more focused on what really 
matters most and for people of faith, the things that matter most is allowing the indwelling Christ to live in us, to save us, to forgive us, and then dare to let him change us and use us. And sometimes those are the hardest words to say. What I thought I saw was not what I saw. What I thought was happening, what really was happening. In that moment, I was wrong. I was blind, but now I see. That's where I hope the Jesus that enters Jerusalem today finds you and finds me. Open to the picture of who he is. Open to the possibility that sometimes we may get it wrong. But if we'll be patient... Let him continue to reveal himself to us. Walk with him in the way. And let him transform our lives. Things will look different. I promise you they will. Because he promised us they will. Let's pray together. Father, one of the most dangerous things in Christian life is to think it's all about us. I'm guilty of that. We all are. And for that we confess. The hardest thing to do is to picture a Jesus who's so much larger and bigger and greater and different than us that we have a hard time getting our arms around that. Lord, one of the hardest things to do is to grow into the point where we recognize when we're doing it not only when others are doing it, but we do it. And to say, Lord, forgive me. Help me, Lord, to be more like you and understand what you're up to. Because for all the times that we want everything to just work perfectly and be wonderful and be right and for us to be the king of the world, of our own world, you remind us that you really were the king of the world. You really are. And that you came and you laid down your life. You lived selflessly. You saw the needs in others and you recognized hypocrisy when you saw it. And you even cared for the people who were like that. Perhaps even the most. Help us, Lord, to find ourselves in this story this morning. And as we walk from here to an empty tomb when we gather in this room next week, let us be mindful of all that had to happen between those two days. For the blind to see. And for those who were looking for what they wanted to find out what they needed. May it be so for us as it was for them. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to stand together and sing, Be Thou My Vision. That's a great, great hymn and a great sentiment this morning. Be Thou My Vision. Let us see things, Lord, as you see them. As John comes to receive our invitation, let us sing.